Okay, so let's talk about the frequent frequency response of an underdamped system. For larger values of t, the transient response dies out, right? Um, this is always true if the system has any kind of damping, or even just significant damping. But damping, if there's any damping and you let it go long enough, the transient response will die out. So therefore, we often just ignore the transient part. Um, so for our frequency response of underdamped systems, we ignore the transient. and we focus on the steady state response, right? So our steady state response is x of p is equal to x cosine of omega t minus phi p. I have a mistake in my notes. Okay, so we want a way to plot uh, the response to the system only in terms of the system's uh, natural and driving frequency, right? So often we just want to know where our system resonates, right? That's the most important thing. Um, let's take a look at that. For example, last night I was buying accelerometers, right? And my accelerometer can measure up to 10,000 hertz. So where does the package of the case of the accelerometer resonate? Right? It would be pretty bad if my accelerometer resonated at 5,000 hertz, because that way any 5,000 hertz signal is going to get amplified through my accelerometer. So they, they list it as the package is, you know, resonates greater than 100,000 hertz um, for peace of mind. I have no idea where it actually resonates. They don't tell you. It's greater than 100,000. Um, so uh, to do that, we want to define a way to plot the response of the system in, on our driving and frequency. So let's define a new term. Um, we're going to call that R, sometimes called beta. Um, and that's going to be omega over omega n. Right? Um, so omega over omega n is going to give us a ratio of our driving frequency to the natural frequency of the system. So recall that um, x is equal to f naught over m over the square root of omega n squared minus omega squared squared plus 2 zeta omega n omega squared, right? If we factor out omega n from the denominator um, and substituting in omega n over, equals k over m, so we have omega n here in the denominator. So let's factor that out um, and, and add in that omega n squared is equal to k over m and that r is equal to omega over omega n, uh, we get a term that looks more like this. x, I'm going to just skip over the intermediate step, um, f naught over k over the square root of 1 minus r squared squared plus 2 zeta r squared. So this becomes the terminology that we commonly use it as, which is x for a given stiffness k, or f naught, which is equal to x times omega n squared over little f naught is equal to 1 
over the square root of 1 minus r squared squared plus 2 zeta r squared in a similar fashion. So right, if we manipulate the equation um, for uh, uh, phi, sorry, uh, phi p, um, we can get that, that phi p is equal to the tanverse, tangent inverse 1 of 2 zeta r over 1 minus r squared. So you can go ahead now um, and plot this out, right? So if you look at your notes, you can go ahead and make this make a whole table for this, right? So for a given um, damping ratio, zeta, right, you can get all of your, your frequency ratios are. So let's go ahead and plot those out, though, because plots are much more exciting. All right, so now we have our normalized amplitude response, right? It's normalized because it's over F naught. So it doesn't matter what your input forcing is. You're always going to get the same normalized response. Does that make sense? So now the goal here is to look at these plots and try to derive how much damping you want to put in the system, right? So if you have a natural frequency of um, that's so so sorry any natural fre frequency ratio right because you're driving over your natural <coughs> if you have a small amount of mean zeta equals 0 0.1 your system is going to oscillate just a little bit below that and what's this value here what's that value there so it's on the x, it's on the frequency ratio, right? That's going to relate, or at least relate, to omega d. That makes sense? Just a little bit below. I mean, we talked about that before. So uh, with, li with limited damping, it's going to act just a little bit below. As you add more and more damping to the system, right, your system is going to oscillate a little bit lower and lower and lower. So actually, it's a little bit harder when they're um, overdamped. That makes sense, right? So an overdamped system is an overdamped system going to oscillate? No, right? And that's why it doesn't have a peak in it. So you you can think, and this is all for this is all for uh, you know these plots are standard for everything. So if you have your driving frequency and your natural frequency, and you can derive your damping ratio, right? So your frequency ratio, your damping ratio, the stiffness of your system, and the forcing function, right? All of this kind of normalizes out, and this is a what a damping plot looks like, right? So what happens if you have zeta equals zero? What happens to our system? And oftentimes you'll see this as beta. I'm thinking about changing in the notes. I'm not really sure. Higher. How high did it go? What happens to our solution to a... Um, so for an undamped case, that's what we did on Tuesday. What happens to our solution for uh, harmonic excitation when omega equals omega n? It's undefined, right? So we have a system 
if you have zeta equals zero, it just kind of looks like this. It's open at the top, right? It doesn't matter how high you draw your plot. The closer and closer you get to it, you'll just get a bigger and bigger number. If you try to actually do it, you won't get a number. So from this plot, we can see that it starts to go to infinity, which is why you want to have damping in the system. So is resonance bad? To this point, we've always kind of like inferred that it was bad. Is it bad? No, it's very controllable, right? We can control for resonance. That's, that's not a huge deal. We have, we have lots of things that are in resonance, you know. Um, no, that's not a good example. No, that's not a good example. You know, there's lots of things that you that you want to like uh, vibrate at a certain frequency. You know, like like a controller for like a game console or something, right? And so you that way, if you know the frequency of your controller, right, you can you can put less energy into shaking it. So there's lots of things that you want like that. And if you don't want it, you just add more damping. The problem with damping is it's expensive sometimes, right? And you may not want to have, you know. 0.5 zeta in your airplane because that sounds expensive and you have to add lots of, you know, extra struts or actual physical dampers if you're not getting it intrinsically from your material properties. So don't be scared of resonance. It's not a problem. It's just something that we have to understand. So we have these phase plots, right? So uh, note that the uh, dashed black line here is here for mathematical reasons um, because if we look at this equation um, for phase, actually, just let me rewrite this here. So phi p is equal to tangent inverse of 2 zeta r over 1 minus r. We don't get a continuous plot. Right, these will kind of come back down, um, and so we put this this dash line here, and we move everything up so we have a nice continuous plot. So if if you try to plot these, you'll you'll see, um, and this is at you know adjust phase values by pi over two. Right. Just kind of a mathematical fix to the to the problem to make nice pretty plots. So this gets us our, our phase delay for a given frequency. Um, and what you'll notice is that, you know, generally, right? So at your driving frequency, you don't have any phase delay. Uh, but when you have a little amount of damping, you'll have a, you know, you can have more or less phase delay, kind of depending on your damping situations just phase right so we, we that should be kind of conceptual that on a damp system steady state if we have a amplitude um, excitation we're also going to have a phase delay associated with that that comes from the damper right and, and just kind of something we need to think about but generally we're much more worried about um, the amplitude excitation, the normalized amplitude excitation as you can imagine right? I mean your, your, your wing's a little bit out of phase. It doesn't matter. We're, we're you know, not a huge deal. Um, OK, so now let's go back to the fact that our max value here is not, I'm just going to delete that. So this is not at omega equal, at omega over omega n. Right? So we don't actually have a max value at omega over omega n, but we want to define that. Right? So we can see here that we have kind of the max values. So let's go ahead and define where those max values are going to lie. So let's solve for the frequency ratio. with max displacement. Right, so this is going to happen at where our d, where our derivative 
So D over dr with respect to r, right, with respect to our frequency ratio of our function x k over f naught is equal to zero. Right, so we know that we have for, for this expression, we have the right-hand side of that equation we had before, which was the 1 over the square root with all the r's. So we can show that 1 over the square root of 1 minus r squared squared plus 2 zeta r squared and to show that we want to take the derivative with respect to r is equal to 0 when our peak is equal to the square root of 1 minus 2 zeta squared, which is equal to omega peak over omega n. Right? So we can find the value of that peak. Um, and, and again, this is the value of r. So if, if we solve, if we solve for this, we're going to get the maximum value of r, and it's going to move more and more to the left as we have as our r value goes farther and farther down. However, this is only for zeta is less than 1 over the square root of 2. Because if if zeta is greater than 1 over the square root of 2, the maximum imaginary peak, uh, the maximum value the max value is at, all right, so oh, go away. And where is it at? So if we have zeta that's less, like for, for, for these here, right? Um, sorry, if we have zeta that's greater, where's our maximum value for these high damping considerations? Zero. Zero, yeah. So is that r equals zero? And, and that's just kind of nice, easy. This is the one you're. This is the one you're looking for. A nice, easy way to get your your peak, right? Which which is of, often what you're interested in in terms of engineering, right? What what is my maximum um, normalized amplitude going to be? That makes sense. Right? I, I'm more interested in knowing this than I am knowing the smaller value at 1 if I'm building this green dotted line. 